Hi, good afternoon. I'm Gurjeet. Um, uh, let me start with the story. So in 2008, um, I was done with my PhD in computational math from Stanford. And uh, I was on my way to becoming a scientist in academia. Um, and it turned out that I saw uh, the Wired magazine, and it proclaimed that it was the end of science. That, as you might imagine, was not very good news for me, because <laughs> that was kind of something I had planned on doing for some significant part of my life. Um, well, it turned out uh, that the thesis that you know, we have so much data, and a lot of the science that's going to be coming out will be discovered from the data. The idea was, uh, was sort of theoretically correct and enticing, uh, but there were major obstacles. And you know, we were not, it's been six years, science still exists. Um, it turns out that uh, another thing of importance came about, which came to be known as data science. Uh, I'm going to quote uh, Jan LeCun, who, was, uh, who is the director of the artificial intelligence lab at, uh, at Facebook. Oh, thank you. Uh, the, the director of the artificial intelligence lab at Facebook and also a world-renowned machine learning researcher who defines data science as the automatic or semi-automatic extraction of knowledge from data. Now, this is very important. Why should it be automatic or semi-automatic? Right? And the idea is that in the near future, most of the knowledge that will be extracted from data will be extracted by machines, and it will reside in machines. And I'll go as far as to say that most of it will be used by machines. So it's a really important idea. So let's actually look at the process of discovering knowledge from data as it, as it is today. Right, so the way it works today is that it usually starts with a person. And this person is usually a very smart person. Right? It's, a, it's someone with, a, with advanced degrees in mathematics or computer science or statistics. Right? So this is usually not a, not a dropout. If you want to start Facebook, maybe consider dropping out. But to be a data scientist, stay in school. <laughs> right? um, so, so this is usually a smart person. They then. <laughs> They then engage in, in hypotheses, right, in coming up with hypotheses, which is a way of, you know, they come up with guesses as to what might be going on in data. Uh, they then have the job of converting it into code of some sort. It might be queries or it might be programs in, in, a, in a proper computer language. Or they might use business intelligence software, which will convert their user interface actions into code for them. You execute it against a database see the results back in BI, maybe you were right, and maybe you weren't. And so the cycle keeps on going for some time. So let's look at, um, let's look at some exponentials. We are at exponential finance. It's only fitting. The first exponential to look at is the increase in data, right? So nine years, $100, we can store 1,000 times more data, right? It is a, it is a law that any time you can store data, you will store data. So data is growing exponentially in time. That's pretty awesome. Uh, the second key idea, the second key bottleneck, is hypothesis. So what is a hypothesis, right? Imagine, imagine if, you, if you had a table of data. Maybe it's a table uh, in which you write down all your customers' names and figure out which products they've bought in the past so that you can recommend them new products, or if a new customer comes in, you can figure out what they might be interested in. Or if you're a hospital, this might be um, a record of patients. So which patient has what clinical markers? Let's look at what is a hypothesis. A hypothesis is a region in this table, is a subpart of this table. So anything that you ask, so for example, uh, all the patients for whom the insulin level is greater than 150, um, you know, they have a certain disease, it's called diabetes, right? So that's a hypothesis. How many such hypotheses exist in this table? Well, it turns out that you can prove it, uh, that if you have n, amount, n, n cells in the data, that the number of hypotheses in the data is 2 to the power n. So it's exponential in the size of the data. So let's add these two things together. Um, data is growing exponentially in time. The number of hypotheses that data can represent is exponential in the size of the data. 
Uh, this is maybe not some very pleasant news. Hypotheses are growing double exponentially in time, right? So just to illustrate that, the bottom line there is linear growth, the second line there is exponential growth, and the third line there is double exponential growth. If I wanted to add one more data point to this exponent, double exponential growth, it would not fit on this graph. So it's growing really quickly. And what are we doing in response to this? Right? We are trying to hire as many smart people as quickly as we can. So this is a chart of the demand of the search volume for the term data scientist on Google over the last four years. Clearly, we want, uh, we want to hire these very, very smart people very quickly. Right? Is that going to help us out? We, have, we are looking for people to solve this double exponentially worsening problem. And over the past many decades, we've made advances in databases. They've gotten faster. We've made BI software easier to use. But is making databases going to help us overcome this double exponential problem? Um, and the answer I submit here is, is no. We need, we need a new way of dealing with this problem. So DARPA actually had this realization uh, in about the year 2000. And they saw a sea change in the way people were doing science. They saw the change in which people had started doing science by creating new large complex data sets, right, which eventually led to the Wired article. Um, and they felt that people who were constructing the best data sets were probably not the best people to analyze them. So they felt that people are drawing incomplete or incorrect conclusions. So they had this blue sky idea. Could you use abundant computational resources to solve this problem? Could you sift through data automatically and discover things with, uh, without or with minimal human interaction? So there was this idea of abundant computation. Well, it turns out that you just can't compute your way out of this problem. You need something else. And they started investing in fundamental math technologies, uh, which is where I was fortunate to interact with this. Um, and the idea is that we, we developed this technology called topological data analysis that combines a large number of machine learning algorithms together. And eventually, when we started my company, Iasti, we also felt that we had to develop user experience technologies to empower human beings to deal with these things that they are now able to automatically discover from data. So just to represent this pictorially, the process now is that you start with data, you automatically run it through a large number of machine learning algorithms, you combine the results together, and the first time a human being enters the picture, they already have something to begin with. So the idea is to empower people to do what they are the best at. Let me show you a few examples of how this works out. This is one of my favorite data sets to talk about. It's constructed from a breast cancer study, which was conducted a, a decade or so ago. And the idea here was that these researchers in the Netherlands Cancer Institute, they collected tumor samples from breast cancer patients, and then they collected 23,000 pieces of uh, gene expression levels from each tumor. Uh, and the question, and the reason why they did that was one, to be able to construct better diagnostics, or two, to be able to construct better drugs for these patients. So this is a decade old data set. It's relatively small by today's standards, but the reason I'm talking about this data set is because for a decade people have mined it. In fact, there are $2 billion companies which, which were founded based on things that they found in this data. Uh, we threw it into our system and it, com in, it constructed this network graph in which every node is a group of patients whose gene expression levels were similar to each other, and two nodes are connected if they, are, if they share some patients. The color of these nodes represent the average mortality of the group. Now, there's a nice blue region down there. Blue means no death, so that's good. Uh, and up top, there is a flare there which contains a lot of people who ended up not surviving. Now, in the past, you would basically relegate that whole arm, and you would say that you know, if you are in that area, maybe things are not looking that good for you. But it turns out that there is, a, uh, there is a significant population of people there who end up surviving. So we were able to discover this new biomarker uh, from this data automatically after people had poured over it for a decade. Another example, so similar to the previous model, uh, in this case, you know, we have data from uh, emergency room visits. Uh, so whenever someone visits the emergency room, as some people here might have, um, 
you know, you go there and you are given a questionnaire which you fill out. What they do with that questionnaire then is that they essentially give you a score. And if the score is not positive or if, you know, if things are uh, bad, then they, you get treated quickly. If things are OK, then you get to wait for a while. Uh, similar to the previous picture, every node here is a group of patients who answer these questions similarly. And the two networks on the top and the bottom are the same except for the coloring. The network on the top is what the model predicted would happen, and the network on the bottom is what actually happens. So notice a couple of things here. Um, the model is, by and large, much more optimistic than real life. Right? So the model usually predicts that people are going to be fine, and things are actually much worse in general. The other important region here at the bottom that I've highlighted is uh, there's a bunch of people who the model said are going to be perfectly fine, and they all end up not surviving. That's pretty bad. Well, it turns out that these people uh, are all people who are too groggy to fill out the interview form. right? So they, they left out a bunch of the, uh, the, the questions in there, and they couldn't fill it out. Um, that should have been an input to the model, but it wasn't. And that's the point here. right? So in, in finance, a lot of the work gets done using models. So it's really important to have a framework that allows you to discover systematic problems in these models. Uh, and automation is a way to do it, because you can't do it manually. Uh, another example, this is work with Mount Sinai right, right here in New York. Um, and they were curious uh, of, about what they would discover if they combined genetic gene sequencing data with clinical data about diabetes 2 patients. And they were able to discover new classes of diabetes 2. So it turns out that if you have the type 2 diabetes, you actually don't have the type 2 diabetes. You have the symptoms that we call type 2 diabetes. You actually have one of you know, three or four other underlying molecular diseases. And again, this would have been completely inaccessible to people had they not run it through this automated system. Uh, this is a model from a, from a financial, uh, from a credit card vendor. And uh, they, they basically ran every transaction through a risk model. And it turned out that there was a particular type of fraud that they were very bad at, at figuring out that it was going on. So in this model, uh, on the right is what, the, what, this, uh, what this credit card company was doing. And they were only able to achieve roughly 30% accuracy. But after debugging this model using this automated topological approach, they were able to you know, increase their efficacy on this model to about 100%. My final example here is from the insurance industry, um, health insurance and hospitals. So uh, health insurance company providers and hospitals have this weird game in which hospitals code for the diseases that happened, and then insurance companies pay them in accordance to what happened. Um, now, over time, some hospitals get smarter at coding, um, and insurance companies end up you know, feeling that they might have actually overpaid. Uh, and so they basically want to figure out if such patterns emerge from the data or not. And again, in this case, you know, you are able to, if you run this data through the system, you are able to automatically discover these patterns from the data without any human intervention. So I'm going to close this with a, with a thought, uh, which, we've, which we've actually heard here in the last two talks, which is that technology already exists to automate most of the jobs that we do manually today. Right? It is, uh, the question is, are you going to disrupt yourself, or is that going to be someone else's opportunity? Um, now, this might sound kind of ominous, but it's actually, it's actually good news, because there is an unprecedented opportunity in enabling people to do what they're the best at, which is to be creative. Right? The, the double exponential problem that we are facing, we don't have to deal with that. With technology, we can solve that and be better at being creative. Thank you. Jersey, thank you. Thanks. So on the technology, what I call technological socialism or technological unemployment, uh, are you a sort of on the positive side of that, that it's going to free us to, as you said, be more creative? Absolutely. So even, in the, you know, even when technology does all of this, uh, for example, in drug discovery, if you, even if you discover a biomarker, uh, it, there is still a gap between reasoning and abstraction that, we, that computers still haven't crossed. 
right? So there's a lot of opportunity for people to be extremely creative. The talk that Jeremy gave in which he was showing us examples of images and text, that required a lot of creativity, right? It was, it was a very smart guy, Richard Sorcher, who thought about it, was creative, and used these models to great effect. So there's a lot of opportunity. Uh, I think uh, it's going to require a re-education of sorts, but I think that's good for the world. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you.